I'm going to share from 1 Corinthians 11 today. If you want to turn there. <clears throat> One of the phrases I noticed Brother Zach used a few times in the last few times he's been with us has really st stuck with me. And so I wanted to share a couple of reflections on that. But one thing that he's mentioned is, um, he said, when you're running and you fall down, how long do you stay on the ground? I don't know if you remember hearing that. He used that expression. When you're running, how long do you stay on the ground before you get up? And he said, that's how fast we should bounce up after we fall. We should bounce back up to Jesus. He said, how long, and he used the picture of a ball. How long does a ball stay on the ground when, it, when we bounce it? It's just instantaneous. It pops right back up. And um, that's how long we should stay down because of sin. We, he, and his point is we shouldn't spend a second um, in self-pity uh, or discouragement or certainly not condemnation. Um, and so I want to share today about repentance, about bouncing back to Jesus. Um, in the Bible, there's a word that's sometimes connected with repentance. It's a little surprising. It's here in 1 Corinthians uh, 11. Or sorry, 1 Corinthians 7. I apologize. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 11. But the word is zeal. I don't know if you've ever thought about zeal being connected to repentance, but it's something that I've seen this uh, past couple weeks that's been an, a help to me. In uh, Revelation 3, verse 19, it says, Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. And um, what I want to share is that I think bouncing back is being zealous about repentance, being zealous about repenting, and um, not being sluggish. There's a, there's a sense in which we can be tempted by the devil that if we're disciplined by the Lord, as it says there in Revelation 3.19, it says, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, that if we're disciplined by the Lord, we can be tempted to almost tuck our tail, ease our way back in, be slow, you know, be um, hesitant. And what the Lord was speaking to my heart these past couple weeks says, no, I want you to be zealous about repentance. I don't want you to tuck your tail and be hesitant or be reluctant. I really want you to be zealous. As he says there in Revelation 3.19, be zealous and repent. And um, the verse in uh, 1 Corinthians 7, sorry, 2 Corinthians 7. Second Corinthians 7, it's, uh, Paul's talking about that he had written them regarding some sin in the first letter. And in this, in this second letter, he says, um, in verse 10, The sorrow that's according to the will of God produces repentance without regret, leading to salvation. But the sorrow of this world produces death. Behold what earnestness this very thing, this godly sorrow, this godly repentance that produced in you. What vindication of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what avenging of wrong. In everything, you, you demonstrated yourselves to be innocent in the matter. And the picture, this, is a, this to me is a picture of the kind of repentance that the Lord wants for us. He wants us to be zealous. He wants us to have a sense of longing and a sense of indignation, a sense of vindication that we bounce back as quickly as possible to the state from which we fell. If we think about that, I believe it's God's will for all of us that we be on fire for the Lord, that we be aflame with a passion and devotion to him. And that um, if that's our normal state, then when we bounce back, what, sh what state should we bounce back to? We should bounce back to a state of fire, to being on fire again, and to being zealous again, and to not allow any kind of stumbling or slipping to cause us to reduce in our heat, or to quickly seek to get back to the same level of heat. Or to say it in a different way, Paul says to the Galatians, when, they're, when they've been kind of distracted by these Judaizers who are tempting them to be circumcised, he says, you were running well. You were running well. And what is, to me, what the heart of the apostle there is, he wants them to keep running. When after, after they've fallen, he doesn't desire that they start walking again. He wants them to go back to running. You were running well. Keep running. You were hot in your devotion before you slipped up. Stay hot. Bounce back to the Lord with zealous repentance. Don't accept kind of lukewarmness and a slow, sluggish start. Seek to restore the zeal that you lost when you fell. Seek to restore the running, the, the sprinting attitude that you had before you fell. What I want to be measuring is not whether I fall, but I think we've heard this before many times, but how quickly do we get back up? 
That's what we've heard. And I was thinking <clears throat> about this, that it's how quickly do I get back hot? How quickly can I get hot again? How quickly am I running again? That's the, that's the metric that I want to be measuring. I want that to be getting shorter and shorter that, yeah, if I slip up, I repent. Absolutely. I confess my sin. Absolutely. But then I seek to be hot again. I seek to be zealous in my devotion. And I've noticed all too often there's this temptation. I can mistake um, mourning for sin, which is a good thing, with kind of being down and being gloomy. And I can accept a sort of gloomy attitude um, rather than saying, no, 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 I don't want to accept it. I don't want to yield to that temptation to be discouraged. I really want to be zealous. I want to be wholehearted. I want to be hot. I want to be on fire. One of the things I think that bouncing back with zeal means is we get back to obedience quickly. Do you ever have this sense, I've, I've experienced this, that if I slip up, if I fall, if I stumble in some area, I can take obedience a little bit less seriously. I think, well, I'm already down, right? And that's just like a runner saying, oh, I fell down. Might as well roll around on the ground a little bit. No, we're meant to get back up immediately and start running. And part of what bouncing back with zeal means is I get back to obeying quickly. As soon as I become aware that I've made a mistake, I, I resolve in my heart, no, I want to start obeying immediately. I'm not going to be casual with obedience now. I'm not going to kind of relax and take it easy and then start obeying once I, once I start feeling better. No, I want to be zealous about taking obedience as seriously as I did before and take God's warning seriously. One thing I remember Brother Zach mentioned, I think it was last week, he talked about how uh, the Apostle Paul in Acts 20 warns the Ephesian elders that savage wolves were going to come into their midst. And I don't know about you, but I can think, okay, if the, if the Apostle Paul warns of that, it's, it's going to happen. It's a foregone conclusion. But what Brother Zach said, he said something interesting. He said, if they had repented and sought the Lord wholeheartedly, they could have escaped the fate that had befallen them by Revelation 3, when, they, when, it, when the um, angel writes to the messenger there by uh, the Apostle John. He says they could have escaped the fate that, they, that befell them by Revelation 3, if they had repented. And that, that really struck me because I, I realized, I think a lot of times a warning, nothing I can do about it. But what Brother Zach was saying is, no, 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 if you repent, if you take the warning seriously, you can repent and you can actually change the course, so to speak. You know, and what Brother Zach mentioned is with Jonah and Nineveh, that Jonah went to Nineveh and he proclaimed destruction. Calamity is going to befall this city. But they repented and what? Averted disaster. Even though God said that calamity was going to befall them, yes, God loves repentance that much. That's one thing that struck me this week. God loves repentance so much, he will even relent of what he already promised will happen. And there's a couple of examples of that that I want to turn to. One's Ezekiel 33. If you turn there quickly, Ezekiel 33. Look at verse 13. It says, when I say to the righteous, this is God speaking. When I say to the righteous, you will surely live. It's a promise of God uh, regarding the future. When I say to the righteous, you will surely live. And then the righteous trusts in his righteousness and commits iniquity. None of his righteous deeds will be remembered. But that same iniquity of his, which he has committed, he will die in that. Wow. God says, when I tell someone you will live and then they sin after they hear it, they're not going to live. What I say will happen is not going to happen. And then look at verse 14. And when I say to the wicked, you will surely die. Think about this. This is God pronouncing this is going to happen. You will surely die. And then the wicked returns from his sin, repents, and practices justice and righteousness. Look at, verse, uh, look at the end of verse 15. He shall not die after all. Verse 16. None of his sins which he has committed will be remembered against him because he's practiced justice and righteousness. He will surely live. And then I saw this in um, the book of Judges. This is the other example. This is what I'm trying to say is how much God loves repentance and how it can affect even what looks like a pronounced judgment. In Judges verse 10, uh, sorry, chapter 10. Judges chapter 10 and um, starting in verse 10. It said, the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord, saying, We have sinned against you. Indeed, we have forsaken God and served Baal. And the Lord said to the sons of Israel, Didn't I deliver you from the Egyptians and the Amorites and the sons of Ammon and the Philistines? And look at verse 13. Yet you have forsaken me and served other gods. Therefore, I will no longer deliver you. This is God saying, because you have rebelled so many times, I am not going to deliver you. 
Go and cry out to the gods which you've chosen. Let them deliver you in the time of your distress. That's a pretty terrible thing to hear. But then look at this, verse 15. The sons of Israel said to the Lord, we have sinned. Do to us whatever seems good to you. Only please deliver us. Verse 16 is the key verse. So they put away the foreign gods from among them and served the Lord. And even though he had said, I will not deliver you, he could bear the misery, the misery of Israel no longer. Wow. God says, I'm not going to deliver you. And they say, do whatever you want. But they turn from their sin. They put away those gods. And it says that God could bear the misery of Israel no longer. So it's amazing to me to see that God responds to repentance in such an amazing way. Even when he pronounces judgment, as we see in Ezekiel 33 and as we see in Judges 10, yet he can't help but, his heart can't help but be moved by repentance. In Ezekiel 33 and verse 11, he says, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked turn from his way. It says, what I see there in Ezekiel 33 verse 11 is, what God takes pleasure in is seeing the wicked turn from his way and live. And even if this wicked person has heard some judgment of God or hurt, or even if it's us hearing from the Lord, I won't deliver you. I'm going to turn you over to this because, because you've disregarded me. Yet, if we will then take that warning, <clears throat> as Brother Zach was saying about the Ephesian elders in Acts 20, even if we hear that and say, what? Savage wolves are going to come in? May it never be. And if they had turned radically and repented wholeheartedly, they could have avoided that fate. And Revelation 3 may not have been, it may have been, been written differently. And I see here that God loves repentance. One question that I was asking is, to myself as I was thinking about this is, it says that Esau could find no place for repentance even though he saw it with tears. And what, I, what I've always read that to mean is, there's sometimes that even if you truly are repentant, you're hopeless. That's what I've always read that to mean. But I'm beginning to think that that's not true. That if you're truly repentant, here's, here's what, that, what that teaches me. Esau must not have done the deeds in keeping with repentance. Both in Luke 3, 8 and in Matthew 3, 8, John the Baptist says to the Pharisees, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. What does that say to me? That repentance, true repentance, is accompanied by obedience. And to me, what, what that must say about Esau, it says that he could find no place for repentance even though he sought it with tears. All he did was cry. All he did was be sad. He did not accompany that sorrow with Actions in keeping with, with repentance, which are obedience. He didn't obey. He just felt sad. He just regretted the fact that he missed out on the blessing. But he didn't cause that regret to send him radically, zealously towards obedience. And because he, he did not do the deeds in keeping with repentance, he found no place for it, even though he sought it with tears. And so I want to get back to obeying quickly. When I see that I've fallen in some area, part of what it means to be zealous about Repentance is, I get back and obey quickly. I take obedience seriously. And I, I say, it doesn't matter. Lord, punish me if you have to. Do whatever you have to do. But I want to obey you. And I want to honor you. And I want you to get some honor out of my life. And one thing that I wanted to say is that bouncing back zealous in repentance isn't inconsistent with a spirit of mourning. Because there's a sense in which I, I kind of think, okay, if I bounce back quickly, if I want to be hot quickly, if I want to start running quickly, where's the place for mourning? Because I, we, we believe that mourning and sorrow over sin is so important. But what I would say, what, one thing is I've been thinking about this, is mourning, if you think back to that analogy of bouncing, you know, bouncing a ball, mourning is the floor on which we bounce, so to speak. That when we fall, what determines the floor or how far we have to fall is what produces a spirit of mourning in us. And whenever we truly mourn our sin and truly um, grieve having hurt God and having trespassed his commandment, that's, that determines the floor. And if we aren't mourning over sin, we'll continue to fall farther. But if we really mourn, there is a place for mourning. That's what I'm saying. There's absolutely a place for mourning. But what determines whether I can turn around and run zealously, repent zealously, is whether I've mourned. And if I've mourned, then I can turn and be zealous. If I haven't felt a sense of sorrow over my sin, grieving over my sin, then there's no place for repentance for me. There's no running back to God prior to that point of turning, which is that point of mourning. The godly sorrow that the Corinthians displayed is different, right? They were sorrowful and it produced a zeal. 
and a vindication and a longing and a passion to, to justify. But there's an un ungodly sorrow as well, which fixes itself upon myself. And it, it manifests, ungodly sorrow manifests in staying down, rolling around on the ground after I've fallen. Godly sorrow certainly produces mourning, certainly produce, produces tears, but it fixes itself upon God. And it manifests itself in quickly bouncing back and running back to obedience quickly, running back to heat and devotion quickly. So the question is, what am I fixed on? Am I fixed on God's promise or am I fixed on my progress? And I've been convicted recently that if I'm too mindful of my own progress, if I'm watching my own progress too carefully, I can fall. What I have to look at is God's promise. I have to fix my eyes on his promise. And I want to always be looking at his promise as the source of my strength and confidence, never, never my track record. His promise is why I can bounce back quickly. Um, and his promise is directed to the brokenhearted. There's an amazing uh, passage in Isaiah 61. If you want to turn there quickly. God's promise is directed to the brokenhearted. <clears throat> this is a, a verse that actually Sandeep texted to the brothers earlier this morning. Jesus quotes it later when he takes up the scroll. He says, um, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. It's Isaiah 61 verse 1. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives, proclaim freedom to prisoners in the favorable year of the Lord. And what I see here is that God's promise is, who does he proclaim good news to? To those who are afflicted. There's no good news for those who haven't been afflicted. It's those who are afflicted that can take, can grab a hold of the promise of good news. Who has he sent to God? Uh, who, who has Jesus been sent to bind up? those who are brokenhearted. I cannot be bound up by Jesus if I'm not brokenhearted over my sin. Who has um, he proclaimed liberty, liberty to? Those who admit they're captives, that they're enslaved in some way. Who has he proclaimed freedom to? To those who are prisoners. And so I see that this, the brokenheartedness, the spirit of mourning is essential to hearing the call to be free and to hear the good news. <clears throat> it says, in verse 3, Isaiah 61, verse 3, to grant those who mourn in Zion, giving them a garland instead of ashes and the oil of gladness instead of mourning. You know, it says of Jesus in Hebrews that he was anointed with the oil of gladness. And I see here, it's, there's an exchange that has to take place. I have to have a, a mourning heart to receive from the Lord the oil of gladness. It says a mantle of praise instead of a spirit of fainting. I have to reach that point, the, the, the bouncing point, where I feel like I'm going to faint. I feel so disappointed, so sad, so brokenhearted over my sin. That's when I re can receive the mantle of praise. He sent Jesus, the Father sent Jesus to bind up those who are brokenhearted. So there's absolutely a place for mourning. That's what I'm saying. And even though our ultimate goal is to zealously repent and to be fiery hot in our devotion to the Lord, as fiery hot as we possibly can, uh, were before and even hotter, and to run as fast as we uh, were before, even though we've fallen. What I see is that I, my eyes have to be fixed on his promise. He will do it. It's not my progress, it's his work. He will write his laws on my heart. He will make me a partaker of his divine nature as I seek uh, him. And the unfathomable riches, the year of, it says year of favor, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. He pours on those who mourn. He pours out that, that assurance of the favorable year um, of the Lord upon those who are mourning over their sin. And so that's why we can bounce back with zeal. So I want to take bouncing back seriously. I don't want to lay down on the ground any longer than I have to, but I really want to have the hope that I can be like the Corinthians. I can be zealous in my repentance, not like Esau and just seek it with tears, but really, truly um, demonstrate the deeds and bear fruit in keeping with repentance.